Hello, this is Hayden Scott. I am the program manager and lead instructor for EMS University San Antonio. Uh, I am an EMT intermediate. Now we're going to go over uh, chapter 4-2, respiratory emergencies. There are three major types of breathing issues. There's difficulty breathing or respiratory distress. Uh, a patient uh, who complains uh, when they have difficulty breathing may have adequate or inadequate breathing. Uh, when a patient complains of shortness of breath, you should immediately treat them with oxygen administration. Uh, no questions asked. There shouldn't be a second thought in your mind. The situation is critical and the patient shows signs and symptoms such as pale or cyanotic skin and general malaise. The cyanosis you'll notice in initially will start uh, around the lips uh, and in the nail beds. Uh, if it progresses farther than this, the situation is getting much worse. Uh, the breathing is very effortful. Uh, they're really struggling for it. Uh, they will have inadequate breathing. Severe respiratory distress indicates that you should start positive pressure ventilation. Um, with a positive pressure ventilation, uh, this will more than likely take form of bag valve mask. Um, the second type will be respiratory failure. Uh, this is when the patient's respiratory effort is lessening. Uh, their level of consciousness is decreasing and you'll notice uh, CNS depression and decompensation as well. Uh, the final type and the worst type of all is respiratory arrest. This is a patient who is not breathing at all. Uh, this obviously goes under the category of inadequate breathing. The respiratory cycle um, is ventilation, uh, inhalation and expiration, um, then there's gas exchange at the al uh, alveolar capillary exchange where oxygen moves into the bloodstream and uh, the cellular waste comes out of the bloodstream and into the uh, alveolar space to be expelled through the lungs. And then perfusion. The bloodstream um, then carries the oxygen to the tissues and organs uh, for gas exchange. Some terminology. Uh, dyspnea is abnormal breathing. Apnea is without breathing or no breathing at all. Hypoxia is low oxygen perfusion. Uh, then you have bronchospasm which is the narrowing of the bronchi and the bronchioles due to swelling and irritation. Uh, this usually results in wheezing. Uh, this is also known as bronchoconstriction. Your initial assessment, um, the general impression your patient will probably be in the tripod position meaning they will be leaning over um, and supporting their weight with one or both hands. Uh, their position could also be bolt upright, uh, supine, or in uh, Fowler's position. Uh, they'll have a frightened or confused facial expression. Uh, this is a very scary uh, thing to deal with. So a lot of your, your patients are going to look absolutely mortified. Um, they're going to have some dysphagia or aphasia. They're not going to be able to talk. Um, if they are, they're not going to be able to get more than one or two words out uh, per breath. Uh, their level of consciousness, they'll either be um, restless, uh, agitated, um, combative. Uh, the combative will be because the uh, brain tissue is not getting enough oxygen. They could potentially be unresponsive or severely lethargic, uh, which means they're just not really doing much at all. <clears throat> You'll listen for crowing, snoring, strider, uh, or gurgling. Uh, this does indicate a partial airway obstruction uh, and should be treated as such. You'll look for adequate and equal rise and fall of the chest. Um, this will indicate uh, adequate tidal volume. Uh, their skin, uh, you want to notice the temperature. Uh, is it, are they warm to the touch? Are they cool to the touch? Are they uh, cold to the touch? Are they blazing hot? Uh, these are all very important things to note and document. Uh, you'll want to notice the skin color. Uh, are they cyanotic? The mucous membranes, are they paling? Are they turning blue? Are they turning purple? Uh, the peripheral cyanosis, as I mentioned earlier, 
the nail beds uh, are the, one of the first things to turn blue. Um, as it creeps up the hands and arms, uh, you're really getting a worsening of, of symptoms there. Uh, central cyanosis um, is a very large red flag. Um, that means their core is not getting uh, enough oxygen at all and your patient's getting ready to crash if they haven't already. If their uh, skin color is pale, you have a little more time, but it's still a very, very big problem. Um, or are they flushed? Um, the flushing of the skin could be indicative that they have a, an extremely high fever, which is why you also have to note the skin temperature. Uh, the skin condition, is it modeled? Um, almost uh, like pruny, like you just got out of the bathtub. Um, it, it, are they ashen? Um, very dry skin, uh, gray colored, very uh, death-like looking, to be honest. Um, is it dry or are they wet? Um, are they clammy? Or is their skin bone dry? You need to note and document all of this um, very well in your patient care report. Uh, it's all very vital. Other assessment considerations, uh, tracheal deviation. Um, this is usually, uh, it, it can be an early or a late sign. Uh, usually a later sign um, indicative of a uh, uh, pneumothorax. Um, it's when the trachea shifts to one side or the other of the throat or the neck, and, and you'll notice that. It, it's very, very distinct. Uh, retractions. Uh, do you see pitting uh, in between the ribs where the uh, intercostal muscles are? Um, are they retracting uh, even their neck muscles? You'll be able to notice all of this in a severe respiratory distress. Um, JVD or J jugular vein distension. Um, uh, you'll see the, the veins on their neck just th uh, sticking out and throbbing uh, profusely. Um, again, it's one of those telltale signs that you'll know it when you see it. Uh, subcutaneous emphysema, it, uh, you'll notice little air bubbles uh, under the skin in the neck or subclavian area. Uh, it it uh, will also um, make a cracking noise. You'll also take the lungs for equal breath sounds. Um, if you don't have equal breath sounds, if one side is diminished um, or both sides, uh, you've got a very real problem. Uh, same for wheezing or, or bronchi or rails or any of those deter of uh, those uh, signs or symptoms. You need to make a note of it uh, immediately and uh, progress on with treatment. The treatment of inadequate breathing um, with an abnormal rate. You'll begin artificial ventilations with either uh, the pocket mask or BVM. Be sure your pocket mask has a one-way valve. You will ventilate 12 times per minute for adults or 20 times per minute for children and infants. Uh, this will provide adequate uh, ventilation as well as positive pressure. For respiratory arrests, you want to confirm on responsiveness usually with a sternal rub uh, as well as um, loudly asking if they are okay. You'll open the airway by jaw thrust or chin lift uh, depending on whether or not you suspect C-spine uh, uh, injury. If there's no breathing, reposition the head. <clears throat> if still no breathing, give one full breath, lasting two seconds, and allow the patient to exhale. Uh, two seconds is um, kind of a roundabout figure. Uh, you want to give a slow breath um, until you see chest rise. Um, again, you'll want to note if there's equal uh, rise and fall of the chest. If the air goes in, give breaths every five seconds with each breath lasting two seconds and allow passively allow the patient to passively exhale between breaths. If no air goes in, reposition the head um, to reposition the airway. Uh, you want to check for a pulse frequently to monitor cardiac status. Um, you, you just want to make sure that uh, they maintain a pulse while uh, you're performing rescue breaths. Now we're going to look at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. 
Uh, this can be classified as chronic bronchitis, which is, uh, they're lovingly referred to as blue bloaters, uh, and also emphysema. These are the pink puffers. <clears throat> They'll have uh, almost a cherry red uh, tinge to their, to their skin. Patients with a history of COPD are more prone to spontaneous pneumothorax as a result of areas called blebs, which are weaker tissue, uh, areas of lung tissue. Uh, decreased or absent sounds on one side of the effective area is a sign of a spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, you'll also could potentially see uh, the subcutaneous emphysema as mentioned a few slides back. Um, again, these are the little uh, air bubbles under the skin, uh, right in the subclavian area or the side of the neck, um, on the side of the affected uh, pneumothorax. Chronic bronchitis usually has a protective cough for three months out of the year for two years. Um, this is obviously why they call it chronic. Um, you'll notice edema, inflammation, and excessive mucus production of the bronchioles and bronchi. Uh, this will uh, be found uh, in the uh, auscultation of the lungs. Um, you'll notice the wet or the um, you'll, you'll notice a wet sound or um, even a wheezing sound, depending on uh, how bad the bronchitis is. Uh, they will have very restricted air movement. Uh, their gas exchange is um, extremely compromised, and this will cause them to retain carbon dioxide or CO2. Your emphysema patients have a loss of elasticity of the alveolar walls. Uh, dis distension of the sacs causes air trapping. Air movement is restricted, and patient retains uh, quite a bit of carbon dioxide, actually. They'll have a thin barrel chest, um, a non-productive cough. They'll have a prolonged exhalation like they're forcing out because they're trying to force out that uh, retained carbon dioxide. Uh, they'll have pursed lip breathing uh, like they're sucking in through a straw. Uh, and you'll hear profuse wheezing and ronchi. As you notice uh, in the diagram here, you'll, you'll see the picture of the uh, normal alveoli on the left. Um, and then the da damaged alveoli uh, with the emphysema on the right. Notice how flattened and weak and irregular they are. Uh, this definitely causes issues with the gas exchange at the alveolar level. Uh, this is why emphysema uh, patients have such a hard time breathing, as uh, they can't get the oxygen across those walls to uh, into the bloodstream, and, which means the CO2 is not making it out of the bloodstream and therefore out of the body. Treatment of COT COPD. Uh, withholding oxygen or high flow O2 due to concerns over a hypoxic drive are not issues in the EMS setting. Um, so, uh, because uh, the EMS contact with the patient is so limited and so short lived, uh, really oxygen restriction uh, shouldn't be a concern uh, when you have a COPD patient. Studies have shown that it takes hours on high flow O2 to influence the hypoxic drive of COPD patients. If a patient needs O2, give them O2. Uh, absolutely. This should never, uh, like I said earlier, this should never even be a second thought in your mind. Uh, if you have a patient with difficulty breathing, no matter uh, their, their background, whether they've got COPD or not, uh, if they need oxygen, you need to give them oxygen. Uh, you want to ensure an open airway, adequate breathing, supplemental oxygen, and position of comfort. Don't force these uh, patients uh, into a position that they're not comfortable with. Uh, this could potentially cause uh, uh, higher anxiety, um, causing hyperventilation and even more respiratory difficulty. So let them sit in a position that's comfortable for them. If it's reclining, great. Uh, if it's sitting bolt upright, that's fine. If they need to lean over into the tripod position, um, that's what they need to do. That's what they're comfortable with, and, and uh, that's just going to make your life a lot easier. Oxygen therapy with humidification is less drying than without humidification. Uh, this it may also help increase patient comfort. Uh, sometimes that dry oxygen is just too much, um, and that can actually uh, cause a burning sensation in the lungs. So uh, if, you, if the dry oxygen is uh, causing a little bit of an issue, uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, uh, humidify it, as long as uh, it's within your local protocols. Um, again, uh, as soon as you get on a trek, you need to become very, very um, comfortable with your protocols uh, as stated by your medical director. Uh, this can make your life a lot easier. 
patients with tracheostomies um, or stoma, uh, these are surgical tubes designed to assist the patient in managing their own airway. Uh, often these become clogged with mucus and uh, can require some pre-hospital management. Decessioning of stomas, though, is an ALS skill. Um, so if you do have a patient with a stoma that has a lot of mucus that needs uh, suctioning, you need to consider an ALS intercept. Uh, this is something that is well beyond um, the EMT's protocol and, and scope of practice. So um, it shouldn't even be attempted by an EMT. Uh, you need to go ahead and get an advanced level provider on board. EMTs can place O2 masks or tubing to a stoma or tracheostomy if they have the proper equipment and training. Um, when caring for a patient with inadequate breathing who has a stoma, you can attach a BVM and provide positive pressure ventilation with high flow oxygen. Um, however, uh, you should probably take care and go ahead and call for an ALS assist if you have a stoma patient. Uh, who, has, who is having difficulty breathing because nine times out of ten they will need that deep suction and, and could potentially need other uh, advanced uh, level uh, interventions. Asthmatic patients, um, this is a reversible narrowing of the lower airways, um, can cause edema, bronchospasm, and inc increased mucus production. Uh, this often causes a lot more serious problems in the long term for your asthmatic patients. Uh, the mucus production does block smaller airways and causes air to be trapped in the alveoli. <clears throat> Exhalation then becomes difficult and patients must force air out past constricted airways. Uh, this is what causes the wheezing on exhalation um, and the exhalation can become an active process and this can compromise the patient's condition. Uh, they fight so hard to exhale. Uh, a lot of times you will see the retractions, uh, the intercostal retractions. Um, with your asthmatics that are in respiratory distress. Um, but it, it takes so much effort to exhale that they do very, tire very quickly, and uh, so they do uh, decline pretty quickly as well. Pneumonia is a viral or bacterial disease infecting the lower respiratory tract. This causes lung inflammation and very poor gas exchange. Um, it does also, <clears throat> as you can see in the diagram here, uh, there is a lot of mucus and fluid production in the lungs, uh, so the air sacs fill with fluid. Uh, this is what causes the poor gas exchange and the respiratory difficulty. Um, if it progresses up into the upper, uh, upper regions of the lungs or into other lobes of the lungs, <coughs> it could potentially um, cause a, a respiratory arrest. Um, uh, the, these patients tend to, to compensate for just a little bit and then they, uh, then they do take a turn for the worst without uh, proper intervention, timely proper intervention. <clears throat> the signs and symptoms of pneumonia are fever and chills, uh, cough, uh, usually productive, uh, dyspnea, of course, uh, a localized chest pain, uh, sharp, and it gets worse with breathing. Uh, you'll also notice on auscultation that you'll hear ronchi or crackles. Pulmonary embolus uh, is a sudden blockage of blood flow through a pulmonary artery or the branches. Uh, this is due to a blood clot or an air bubble. Uh, it could be a foreign body, uh, even a fat particle. Uh, this obviously decreases the gas exchange and it results in hypoxia. Um, it's very sudden uh, onset and it could absolutely be very detrimental very quickly. The risk factors. Um, and, and, you, and you'll actually see a lot of this come up uh, in your sample history. Um, recent surgery, uh, prolonged immobilization uh, uh, of a limb, uh, multiple fractures, uh, thrombophlebitis, chronic atrial fibrillation. Um, this is one of the, actually one of the biggest uh, risk factors for a pulmonary embolus is the chronic AFib. Uh, as well as um, some medications uh, can cause uh, an increased clotting factor which would cause a, an embolus to uh, form and uh, block, uh, cause a blockage in the lungs. Suspect if uh, sudden onset of unexplained dyspnea, hypoxia, tachypnea, and stabbing chest pain. Um, it, it'll come on very quick but your patient will also decrease even quicker. Uh, you have to be on top of this. Um, the second, uh, a sudden onset 
uh, of an unexplained dyspnea or chest pain uh, comes up, th this should be one of the first things that crosses your mind. Uh, they will have normal breath sounds and they'll have adequate volume. Uh, they'll just have um, unexplained, uh, almost um, uh, shortness of breath of uh, what we consider an unknown etiology. And, and this could be, like I said, very detrimental very quickly because um, this patient will decline very, very quickly. Acute pulmonary edema uh, is an excessive amount of fluid between the alveoli and the capillary space. Uh, this, of course, disturbs and uh, can completely restrict gas exchange, causes severe hypoxia, and it may be cardiogenic uh, or uh, caused by congestive heart failure and non-cardiogenic, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, uh, and you see here on the right um, the different vitals uh, and stuff. Uh, you got oxygen on the patient, IV fluids, respirations at 36. The O2 sacs are only 90% though. BP is 90 over 55, heart rate of 125. Uh, uh, this is a trauma patient involved in a car accident. And, and they, because they're laying sedentary, they just have a lot of fluid on the lungs. Uh, the Causes of ARDS include pneumonia, near drowning, massive blood transfusions, uh, pancreatitis, trauma, and sepsis. Um, the signs and symptoms include uh, dyspnea, or shortness of breath, tachypnea, rapid breathing, uh, anxiety and restlessness. Um, you'll see the anxiety and restlessness in most of your um, respiratory distress patients. Uh, decrease in oxygen saturation, um, and it, it won't necessarily be... Um, very slow either. It'll it'll be uh, pretty significant pretty quick. Uh, tachycardia, uh, this will increase as the oxygen saturation level decreases as the body's way of trying to get the oxygen to where uh, to the uh, critical tissue uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and cyanosis, the blue skin coloration, um, again this will start uh, circumoral or around the lips uh, and the nail beds and it'll slowly move to the core and the closer it gets to the core the, the more detrimental the situation is. Um, signs and symptoms again uh, with acute pulmonary edema, the dyspnea that gets worse with exertion. Um, it also uh, increases when lying down. It usually tends to get a lot worse uh, to the point to where the patient will um, get extremely anxious and um, will not be able to get past usually about a 75 degree angle when laying down. Uh, they will have blood tinge sputum. Uh, tachycardia, uh, the worse it gets, the, the higher the tachycardia will be. So, so that's going to be a pretty good indicator as to uh, how, how bad the pulmonary edema really is. Um, they will have pale, moist skin. Uh, usually a cool and clammy skin. Their lower extremities, you'll actually notice uh, a pretty substantial edema. Uh, so uh, uh, don't always ignore the extremities when you when you have a patient in respiratory distress because uh, that could be a pretty good indicator as to what's going on with your patient. Uh, respiratory for your pediatric patients. Um, respiratory intervention must begin quickly and monitored at all times. Um, you've got to know the difference in the structures uh, between pediatrics and adults. Uh, there is a pretty great difference. Uh, you notice the flexi straw here. Um, that is about the diameter of the pediatric airway. Uh, it's pretty small uh, <clears throat> and not as flexible as a bendy straw, unfortunately. Inadequate pediatric breathing, the early signs are the accessory muscle to use. Uh, again, that's the uh, intercostal retractions. Um, tachypnea, tachycardia. Uh, like I said, with, with, with all of your uh, respiratory distress patients, they're going to be pretty tachycardic. One, from the anxiety. Two, because their body's trying to get the oxygen around uh, through the bloodstream. The nasal flaring is a very, very big uh, very critical uh, sign to look for, especially in a child. And then, of course, the coughing. 
the late signs of inadequate breathing, um, cyanosis to the extremities, and that we're not talking just the nail beds either. Um, the, the whole extremity will be um, cyanotic and uh, could be model booking. Um, they, um, if they start grunting, this is a very, very bad sign. Uh, this is usually seen in infants during exhalation, uh, signaling imminent failure, which means uh, uh, as soon as an infant starts grunting, uh, as soon as a child starts grunting, you need to get a BVM available immediately um, and have it on standby because your patient's getting ready to uh, potentially go into respiratory arrest. Um, altered mental status, which happens um, in your severe respiratory distress cases, simply because, like I said, the oxygen just can't get to the brain, so uh, this causes an altered mental status. The pulse rises early, um, and then all of a sudden it'll plummet, uh, and, and you'll get the real bad bradycardia. Uh, the second bradycardia sets in, uh, you can just about put money on down that your patient's about to go into respiratory arrest if they haven't already. Uh, hypotension. Um, the, the hypotension will especially be noticeable in the older pediatric patients. Um, the irregular breathing pattern is a, a dead giveaway that your patient's about to go into uh, uh, respiratory arrest. Uh, the seesaw pattern, uh, it's when the abdomen and chest move in different directions. Um, this is a very, very, very bad sign. Uh, just as bad as the grunting is. Um, the limp appearance, uh, when your child stops fighting, um, you really need to be concerned. Uh, if a pediatric patient isn't trying to get away from you, uh, you know you've got a really sick kid on your hands. Um, their head will also bob with each breath. Um, th this means that their their body is just trying and fighting to to get in as much oxygen as absolutely possible. With pediatrics, you need to distinguish whether the airway problem is upper or lower. Uh, with your upper airway issues, uh, you're going to hear strider and uh, crowing, and that's what's going to indicate your upper airway obstruction. This is usually due to edema uh, or a foreign body obstruction. Um, the edema could even be in something so simple as the uh, epiglottis or the tongue structure. So you need to be very, very careful about looking for that stuff. Your lower airway issues, uh, wheezing is, is going to be your, your biggest sign of any uh, lower airway problems. The pulse oximetry. Pulse oximetry is a method of detecting hypoxia by, me by measuring the saturation level of hemoglobin with oxygen. Uh, the reading is displayed with either a graph, number, or waveform. The pulse oximeter should be connected to a patient's finger. Um, in your pediatric patients, um, the toe is probably the best bet. Uh, in your geriatric patients, um, the earlobe is, is more widely used. Um, can also be used on the bridge of the nose, uh, depending on your patient's uh, level of consciousness and uh, just how combative they are, um, how bad they're pulling at uh, the pulse ox on other uh, places on the body. Most pulse oximeters do display heart rates. Uh, however, you want to make sure the heart rate on the meter coincides with the palpable pulse on the patient. If it doesn't, then your pulse ox reading probably going to be wrong as well. The pulse oximeter is a tool. Do not substitute it for good assessment skills. In the end, treat the patient, not the monitor. Uh, if, you're, if your pulse oximeter is showing an oxygen saturation level of 76, and your patient is nice and pink and, and isn't showing any signs of respiratory distress, then chances are your pulse oximeter is wrong. However, if your pulse oximeter is showing 100% uh, and they're blue and, uh, you know, good and cyanotic, mottled, unresponsive, and, and really pushing to breathe, you can pretty well bet that, that your pulse oximeter is not entirely accurate. Limitations to pulse oximetry. Uh, it does need pulsatile arterial blood flow for an accurate reading. Uh, the reading is indirect, and therefore it is delayed. Uh, it is not a true instant evaluation of saturation. Um, it also does not measure offloading of oxygen to the cells, 
So therefore, it doesn't really measure a true tissue perfusion. The only way to, to truly measure tissue perfusion uh, pre-hospital setting is, is simply by looking at the skin color. Uh, if there's cyanosis, then there's inadequate tissue perfusion. Uh, the pulse ox may display skewed or erratic readings if uh, the patient's in shock or um, hypoperfused, uh, shunting, uh, hypothermia, or a cold injury. Again, uh, the, the body will shunt. Uh, the patient uh, excessively moving, uh, such as seizures, uh, any nail polish, um, especially your darker nail polishes, um, even the red, the bright red nail polish will block the infrared light from penetrating the nail bed. So the, this will definitely uh, skew your, your display read. Um, carbon monoxide poisoning uh, displaces O2 on the hemoglobin. It's actually more um, affinitive to the hemoglobin than oxygen is. So um, your pulse ox may read 100%, uh, but if, say, your patient has uh, got a bright cherry red, has a headache, or is unresponsive, uh, chances are you've got an issue with carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and, and your pulse oximeter is going to read uh, 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 false. Uh, smokers, the carbon, uh, there's carbon monoxide in cigarettes, so there again, you're going to get a false reading. Uh, anemic patients uh, have a decreased amount of hemoglobin to be saturated. So um, again, you're going to have a bit of an erratic uh, uh, reading on your pulse oximeter. MDIs or metered dose inhalers, uh, each of these delivers a precise dose of medication each time the canister is depressed. Uh, they uh, contain bronchodilators. Before using, the patient must have the signs and symptoms of breathing difficulty. Uh, they also have to have a, a physician-prescribed MDI. Uh, make sure the prescription is in their name. You also have to have approval for medical control um, in order to assist the patient. Uh, again, uh, as with uh, as mentioned in the previous uh, lecture, uh, you need to check the name of the medicine, the date, and the name of the uh, of the prescribed patient. Um, make sure all of these match uh, against what medical control has given you direction for, as well as uh, the patient that you have on board. You want to shake the canister for at least 30 seconds. The contraindications for uh, um, an, an, an MDI is if you have a patient that's not responsive enough to follow directions. Um, the medication is out of date, obviously. Um, it's not prescribed for the patient that you have uh, in your care. Uh, permission has not been granted by medical control. Or the patient has already taken the maximum allowed dose of uh, prior to EMS arrival. Uh, this is going to come from a very detailed uh, sample history. So, so you got to make sure that you do a detailed exam before you uh, get to trying to administer any medications. In order for administration, you have to have the patient exhale fully. And then you'll have them wrap their lips around the opening on the MDI. They'll inhale slowly as you depress the canister. Uh, you want to hold it for about five seconds. Uh, they'll hold in their breath for 10 seconds, and then exhale slowly. For a metered dose inhaler, the EMT should wait at least two minutes prior to administration of another dose. Um, sometimes uh, a patient that requires a metered dose inhaler, um, the initial administration, they may not be able to hold their breath for 10 seconds. Um, if they're not able to, um, they need to hold it as, as long as possible. Let that ox uh, let that uh, medication get down into the lungs uh, for it to be properly absorbed. Um, but it, they should at least hold it uh, between six to eight seconds um, for proper uh, absorption to occur. Um, but as close to 10 seconds as absolutely possible. 10 seconds is vital for um, complete absorption of the medication. Side effects of the MDIs include tachycardia, arrhythmia, anxiety, and nervousness. Uh, this concludes the respiratory emergency portion. Um, if you have any questions, 
please direct them to your instructor.